everyone, and welcome to episode 47 of the Medieval Podcast. I'm Danielle Sabalski, also known as the 5-Minute Medievalist. Now, last week, I was talking with Anne Terrio about some of our influences for the things that got us interested in the Middle Ages, and I said Disney was one of them. Robin Hood, the one with the fox, Sleeping Beauty, those are definitely things that influenced me early on. But those aren't the only things that got me interested in the Middle Ages, and one of those things that I think is common to a lot of us is medieval novels. And for many of us, it's medieval romance novels that get us interested in the Middle Ages. And there were a whole lot of them that were written back in the day, 30 years ago or more. Right now, the trend seems to be on Regency romances, so dukes and stuff doing ducal things. I'm never going to understand that, but that's okay. (laughs) A lot of people are into their romantic dukes. But this means that people are writing fewer medieval romances, and there's definitely a huge demand for them. And I am interested in getting more people writing more medieval romance novels, not because they're really fun to read, but also because if we are just reading about dukes right now, then the people who are interested in medieval romance novels are reading old ones, which are based on old ideas and old scholarship. And uh, they have things in them that, you know, we are not big fans of these days. So I think it's really important that romance writers, that that we get back into the medieval period and we start writing more romance novels. And so today is going to be all about things that I think it's important for romance novelists to know. I've tried to organize my thoughts. It might actually be sort of a rant, but but we'll see. Bear with me. So the first thing I want to say before we get started on this was two things. First of all, a little disclaimer. I'm going to be talking a little bit about sexuality. I mean, medieval romance novels, right? So if you have your kids in the car, you don't want to be talking to them about this type of thing quite yet, then maybe save this episode for later. I also want to briefly address sexual violence because that is something that is that often comes up in romance novels, the threat of sexual violence. And so I want to talk about that a little bit in terms of how it would look in the Middle Ages, in terms of the fiction that we might write about that time. So that disclaimer is first, that we're going to talk about some stuff that might be uncomfortable. So just be aware of that before we start. The other thing is I'm going to be talking about my work quite a lot. And this isn't because I have a massive ego I don't think that is, you know, even remotely the case, but it's because I've been writing about this stuff for over a decade and my wheelhouse, my jam, the thing that I love is to make medieval history more accessible for people who are just starting into it. So this has been kind of the basis of my career. So I'm going to be coming back to the stuff that I've written and done podcasts on and stuff specifically because this is my jam. I do recommend, of course, that you read more widely than just me, especially because one more thing I want to say to you is that I came to medieval history and medieval literature through the Arthurian tradition. So for me, most of the stuff that I have studied over the course of my work has been England and France. So I just want to say that right up front, my specialty is in this northern part of Europe, kind of where a lot of people have situated a lot of their stuff. I'm seeing that people who are interested in writing more romance novels are expanding beyond those horizons and I think that is super awesome. I just want to say that my specialty is England and France so just so you know um, that's where I'm coming at it from and of course there are a million scholars who are working on other parts of Europe and indeed the entire world so definitely look them up if you are interested in other parts of Europe which I am. I'm just not a specialist in those things. So when we start to write about the Middle Ages, the first thing that I say in pretty much everything I've ever done, written, talked about is I really want people to look at the people of the Middle Ages as real human beings. So whatever we tend to spend our time thinking about, whether it's ourselves, whether it's uh, our neighbors, what are they into, um, whether it's what we want to wear today, what we want to eat today, these kind of normal things are what you can expect from people in the Middle Ages as well. So I think that the really good novelists, they already are on board with that. We look at a character from the Middle Ages as being a human being fully rounded, I think that this is not always the case when people look back to the Middle Ages. So I want to start there by saying, really look at when you start to create a medieval character, look at them as somebody that you would know 
and recognize somebody who has different types of motivations like are they in it for themselves are they a charitable person what kind of a person is this person and really give them the benefit of the doubt as having as much intelligence as we have today now not everyone has as much education as we have today that is certainly true a lot of people were unschooled in traditional ways but this does not mean that they're not intelligent so I really want to start there. It might be kind of obvious, but it doesn't always seem that way when I read fiction or see fiction about the Middle Ages. Often they are seen or portrayed as people who are less intelligent than we are, and that's certainly not the case. So the first place I want to start is to give them the benefit of the doubt as being fully rounded human beings with all the same intelligence that we have today. And I think this is important because many times a plot that you'll have set in the Middle Ages has to do with some sort of a crime or a mystery or something like that. And we often will have people miss clues because, I don't know, they're not smart enough. These characters aren't smart enough to have caught them. So maybe a place that I want to start is people in the Middle Ages had very good powers of observation. And I do say this in my, my new book, Life in Medieval Europe, Facts and Fiction, because it was really important to their survival. Right? So they had to notice very important details in their everyday life to make sure that they were able to eat. For example, you notice a lot of things about the natural world that are subtle that we might not notice today. And why is this important? Well, when it came to crimes in the Middle Ages, they did look at things like forensic evidence. So if you have a crime that's set in the Middle Ages, you should expect that these people are going to be looking for clues. They're going to be looking for stuff like what is the shape of the wound? How deep does it go? What could it be caused by? They're also going to be looking for clues like is there maybe a paint scraping? Are there tire treads that look like, not tires as in rubber, but wheel treads? Does this look like ones that we see in the marketplace? You could track that kind of stuff. When somebody was killed in the Middle Ages, you had a coroner investigate to see what was going on. And this is because they were as interested in justice as we are today. Now, it was a lot harder for them to accomplish justice because they didn't have a unified police force like we do today. But they did have investigations into deaths to see if they were suspicious or not. And this is something that I talked about in the book, something I've talked about on Medievalist.net. A perfect example is Stephen Bednarski's book, which is about a woman who was accused of poisoning her husband. The book is called A Poisoned Past. A woman accused of poisoning her husband and a doctor comes in and says, well, no, I've looked at the symptoms and this isn't poison. And you see this as somebody who's investigating a death that has been considered possibly suspicious. The interesting thing about this case is that the doctor is Jewish as well. So for the people who are asking questions about interfaith relations, I'm going to get to that a bit later, but you do have Jewish physicians being seen as experts in court cases. So that's a couple of things that are quite interesting. So if you want to create some characters, not only in romance, but any type of fiction that are sort of Sherlock Holmes characters that look at these forensic details, that is not going to be beyond the pale. It's going to be something that people would be looking at at the time. They didn't have the technology that we have for things like CSI, but they would be looking at forensics and they would be using this in criminal trials. So Powers of observation were quite good, just as they are today. Now, when it comes to people and what they're interested in, if you look around the internet, and especially my stuff, you'll see that my favorite medieval movie is A Knight's Tale. And uh, I'm, you know, I'm going to defend that till the day I die. It's my favorite medieval movie. And it's because what they really get at in this movie is what people are interested in on the day-to-day. -day. So they're talking about fashion, and they're talking about sports, and who's into who. And in this movie, you'll see that politics really takes a back seat to this. Now, I think there are so many places in which you have novels that have politics kind of in the front seat. They're driving it. That can be really good. But for if we're looking at other people's experiences, politics, depending on who you are, where you are, could very much be in the background. Like if you are living at the court of England during the Wars of the Roses, yeah, you want to really be in tune to the politics and even peasants during the Wars of the Roses would be wanting to follow who's in charge at the time. But there's many periods of peace in Europe. Most of the time, people weren't actually actively fighting, believe it or not. 
And sometimes politics was not that important to everybody's everyday life. So things like this, you do want to make sure that you know who's on the throne, who is the Pope at the time. But politics don't have to be front and center in a medieval novel. So when you're writing, you don't have to be intimidated by not knowing every single person who is active in the court at the time. Sometimes politics is just not that important to the story. So I've talked about people being human beings and we should look at them kind of like we look at our neighbors, you know, what are we interested in from day to day. I do need to say that it was a culturally different time. So most of Europe, with the exclusion of what is now Spain and Portugal, most of Europe for most of the Middle Ages was Christian in the tradition that is now what we call Roman Catholic. At the time, there was no Catholic Protestant. That didn't happen until after 1500, the end of the Middle Ages. For me, that's kind of the dividing line for what is Middle Ages and what is early modern. But they're following what we call a Catholic tradition. So everybody's life revolved around religion, whether or not they believed in God or believed in the particular dogma that was being laid down by the church. So what I mean by this is that religion was really kind of integrated into every single part of your day. So for example, if you're living in a city or close to a church, you'd hear the bells ringing the canonical hours. So, I mean, you can never escape it. How do you tell time? Well, you tell time by the bells that are ringing out. So, I mean, that kind of stuff, small details has to do with religion. Also, the days of the week were determined by what was What was important for you to be doing in terms of your religion? Sunday, you know, is a day of rest. It might be the day you go to Mass. Not everybody went to Mass all the time. In fact, you only really needed to confess once a year in order to be a saved Christian. You'd want to do that more often if you're really concerned about your religion. Uh, You'd also want to confess before you died, but not everyone went to Mass all the time. That said, We knew that Sundays, Sunday was a day when you're not supposed to be working. Also, there are saints days constantly all the time in which you're not supposed to be working. Um, There are days in which you are not supposed to be eating certain things. For example, you're not supposed to be eating meat on Fridays. You're supposed to be changing your diet during Lent. And even in the interest of, you know, medieval romance novels, there are days of the week when you're not supposed to be having sex. And I, I, I'm going to refer you more than once today to my podcast with Eleanor Yaniga and to her work, which is a blog called Going Medieval. And she will talk to you about, she will talk to us about what kind of rules there were about when you could have sex, for example. So while I do want you to think of people in the Middle Ages being human beings with the same sort of priorities, they did have a very religious culture, whether or not they believed in it. And not everybody was a believer. You'll see this in my new book as well, Life in Medieval Europe. Not everyone believed in what they were supposed to believe. Sometimes this was something that caused a lot of internal turmoil, something that they really, really wrestled with. But you don't necessarily have everyone believing everything that they're supposed to. People are people, right? So you can have somebody that doesn't necessarily follow the church's teachings. And that is perfectly fine. One place I think is important for people writing medieval romance novels is swearing was also religious. So people were swearing, they'd be saying stuff like God's teeth, by God's nails, that kind of thing. King Richard I was somebody who really liked to swear a lot by God's teeth and nails and hair and whatever. Again, this is a place where you'd see religion coming up. And then the last thing I want to say about religion in this context, as in it being something that you'd see kind of pervasively, and again, this is something that Eleanor Yanaga has talked about on her blog, but the church at the time was not anti-science. So the people who were educated at the time were educated through the church. Doctors, lawyers, teachers, these people were all educated through the church. And if you wanted to find the people who were the most educated or the most pro-science, you'd find them in the church. This is why when you look back to medieval history, some of the people who were making kind of the biggest discoveries were monks. There's a lot of reasons for this. First of all, they're educated through the church. And secondly, they have that time to actually work on scholarship. They are not people who are working in the fields necessarily, although they did work. But they were people who had the time, had the libraries, and could actually put this time into creating inventions or coming up with scientific ideas. So the church, as in the Christian church, was not against science in any way. 
it's kind of a tired stereotype to say that they were. If you're thinking about the church persecuting scientists, you are probably thinking about Galileo. That is much after the Middle Ages. That's later. That's a later period. The church is not anti-science. And in fact, some of the best scientists that you'll find at this time are Muslim. And this was accepted by pretty much everybody. So a lot of the stuff that you learn in universities was from Muslim texts. For example, Avicenna was a Muslim scholar whose canon of medicine was taught in medical schools at the time. Most of the people who were going to these universities were very much Catholic, yes, but they accepted the fact that the Muslims were really the front runners in things like science, medicine, mathematics at the time. So where would you find scientists? You'd find them in the church or you'd find them in different places that were Islamic. So I'm going to come back to religion again in a minute. One of the things that I saw on Twitter, and I really have to thank Elizabeth Kingston for getting me started on this rant, um, is that there are a whole bunch of people who want to write medieval romances and they haven't yet. And Elizabeth Kingston was saying, everybody should do this. She's the one who inspired me to do this podcast today. But I saw in the thread that a lot of people want to write medieval romances that feature people who are not, they're not just heterosexual cisgendered people. And I think that is super awesome. And I also think that that is not a historical. So if you want to write about somebody who is LGBTQ, go for it. Absolutely go for it. So let's talk about it for a second. Where do we find this kind of stuff in the Middle Ages? And Elizabeth did ask me to talk a little bit about people who were trans back in the day. Now, we don't see a lot of evidence of this. That's not to say that trans people did not exist. But it's just people who are trans uh, as well as people who are not straight were people who had to hide this as much as possible. So the silence on this topic doesn't mean that these people did not exist. It meant that they were protecting themselves by being as hidden as possible. So there are a few cases that we find in the Middle Ages of people who we might call trans. I want to be careful with this because... These were not labels that people used at the time. And we want to be careful about assuming the reasons behind their dressing or behaving as the opposite gender. At the time, they were considered to be two genders. That was it in Europe. And so the reasons why you might dress or act as the opposite gender are vast and varied. So I don't want to say these necessarily these people were trans as we understand it today. So I'm just going to give you examples that we have of people who might or might not be trans. It's it's really hard to say. So the first one, maybe the most popular one, is John or Eleanor Reichner. Um, this is somebody who was arrested for prostitution in England. And this person dressed as a man and dressed as a woman and worked as a prostitute, mostly as a woman. Also worked, I believe, as a seamstress as a woman as well. It seems as if this person, John Eleanor, was dressing as a woman for work. They seemed to get a lot of clients when they were dressed as a woman. Um, they made a quip during their trial saying that they like priests best because priests pay more. It seems like they got the most, the most work as a prostitute dressed as a woman. So I'm not sure that we would label John Eleanor Reichner as trans. There's also some in Italy. I will find the name for you, but I've forgotten it. These cases you can find in Ruth Mazokaris's work. And she was also a guest on the podcast in early 2019. So I would ask you to check that out. And also Sexuality in Medieval Europe. Her book is fabulous for this. So someone in Italy whose name I've just forgotten was a person who was living as a woman, was born a man, was living as a woman. It seems like this person might have been uh, what we would call trans in that they were spending most of their time and living as a woman for personal reasons. This person was executed for that. You will find that these people tend to be executed for this and I'm going to get to the reasons for that in a second. Another person we know dressed not as their gender was Joan of Arc. Of course, she did this for practical reasons. We don't know if there are more reasons than that. There's pretty much no talk of her sexuality from her 
she was focused on her mission. She was focused on her visions. People did cast aspersions on her sexuality. Of course, she's a woman who's doing stuff that she's not supposed to do as a woman. So of course, people targeted her sexuality. But she did dress as a man. That was a problem for people. Again, I'll get to that in just a second. Another person uh, that again is in Ruth Mazo Karras's work is Katerina Hetzeldorfer. Katerina Hetzeldorfer lived as a man, lived with a female partner, and seems to have spent their life as a man. So this, again, might be somebody who's an example of somebody we might call trans right now. Again, Hetzeldorfer was killed for this. I do want to say a couple of things about this. People who were trans or who were dressing as the opposite gender, these kind of examples, you see them being persecuted, being prosecuted by the church. When somebody did something like this once, they were found to be dressing as the opposite gender. They were living as the opposite gender as people understood it at the time. That was a problem because it was, as they considered it at the time, upsetting the natural order. So somebody like Katharina Hetzeldorfer was somebody who was living as a man. She was not supposed to do that. That was not her job as somebody who was born female. So if this happened once, usually the church would be in charge of prosecuting this. They would ask you to repent. They would ask you not to do this anymore. And in all of the cases that I've just mentioned, these people continued to dress as the opposite gender. And that is really where the problem was. They were, you know, what you would call unrepentant. The medieval church really believed in giving people more than one chance. They even did this with Joan of Arc. They gave her more than one chance. Of course, the deck was rigged, uh, especially for Joan. They did not want her to continue. Which they did not want her to live. And so she didn't have many options other than to put the male clothes back on. But again, this was upsetting what they thought of as upsetting the natural order. That is why these people were prosecuted. That is why they were executed. So when you write about these characters... They might get caught by authorities. They would not get executed right away. They would be given the chance for what the church would consider repentance to change their behavior, to start acting like the gender that they were born as. And then if they continued to take up the dress of the opposite gender, then then they would be in trouble. Then they would be convicted and punished. So there are very few examples of trans people. This is not because they didn't exist. It's because they had to hide themselves. And if they hid themselves very well, there's no way for us to know where they were. Again, I really want to refer you to Ruth Maisel Karras' work on this. She has done a lot of work on this. Um, She knows a whole lot more about it than I do. And so if you're going to write characters who are trans, do look at her work and see how they were perceived at the time. So similarly, people who were lesbian, gay, bisexual, these people existed as well. And if we don't have a lot of examples of these romances, it's because they were hiding it. Again, I'm going to refer you to Eleanor Yaniga's work and Ruth Mazokaris's work. But I think we talked about this more on Eleanor Yaniga's podcast with me. Again, when you look at, when, if you start to write characters who are LGBTQ in the Middle Ages, They are not going to go by those labels. They did not have those labels at the time. What they labeled was whether these sexual acts were moral or immoral. And as Eleanor will tell you, the only kind of sex you were supposed to have, and this went for everybody, was heterosexual sex for the purpose of having children. And even then, you weren't supposed to enjoy it too much. And you're only supposed to have it on certain days. So that being said, this is the church's stance on this. Oh, you were supposed to be married as well. Can't forget that. So heterosexual married sex for the purpose of having children and you don't enjoy it too much. Now, this is what the church was telling people to do. Obviously, people were not just doing that. (laughs) If it's a sexual practice that we have today that does not involve technology, then you can bet that people were practicing it at the time as well. If you were practicing an act that was not meant to lead to pregnancy, this was sodomy. And again, Eleanor will tell you, sodomy does not just mean, as she says, butt stuff. Sodomy was a sexual act that did not lead to pregnancy. So if a married couple was having oral sex, they were sodomites. Same with a gay couple, same with a lesbian couple. They would be considered sodomites. Again, you would only apply this label of sodomite to somebody if they continued to do it. 
So there is penance and Theodore's Penitential is something that you can find on the internet. In fact, somebody is tweeting as Theodore's Penitential as well. And you can see that there are different levels of penance that would be applied to you if you were caught masturbating once, if you were caught giving oral sex, if you're caught receiving oral sex, it's different. And again, it's the acts themselves that are what people might take issue with. So if you have a character that is attracted to somebody of the same sex, it doesn't necessarily mean that everybody thinks this is the way that they were born and are always going to be like this. People are looking at individual acts. So when you write a character who is not straight, just be sure to remember that the, that person at that time would not necessarily label themselves as a certain way. They would, of course, know who they were attracted to and all that kind of stuff. People are people. They know who they're attracted to, but they wouldn't have a label for it. Again, I'm going to refer you back to my favorite um, sexual historians, uh, <laughs> historians of sex, I should say, uh, Ruth Mazo Karras and Eleanor Yaniga. It's really, really interesting stuff. It's going to be really important for you as romance writers. So I really refer you to their stuff to learn more about what it was like to be somebody who was not, you know, your typical straight cisgendered person. Okay, while we're on the topic of sex, let's go to the nasty side for a second. There are a lot of novels, historical novels, and even contemporary novels in the romance genre that have the threat of sexual violence. So... Let's talk about that in terms of the Middle Ages. So there's something I want to be very clear on at the outset, and that is rape was not permitted in medieval Europe. Forget Braveheart. There was no prima nocta. Lords did not have permission to sleep with their peasants. That was not permitted. So I do want to say this at the outset. People did not have rules that permitted that in terms of two people who were not married. It comes back to the fact that nobody was supposed to be having sex outside of marriage at all anyway, but nobody condoned rape for people who were not married. Now, this is tricky because people who were in a marriage, both of them were supposed to provide what's called the conjugal debt to their spouse. So this means that a man could demand sex from his wife at any time, but also that a woman could demand sex from her husband at any time. And so marital rape was not something that was understood at the time as being rape. What we might think of as a stranger's uh, sexual assault that's not permitted in marriage, there, there wasn't a law against it because there was a conjugal debt between spouses. Now, I do want to say that if somebody was having a really hard time in a marriage, they could get a separation. Again, this is something that Ruth Mazo Karras talks about in that podcast with her and in her book. So you can look at that. But there was not a law against marital rape. That's something that you should know. Another thing you should know is that you could be let off for it if you married the victim. So this is another thing that's horrible, but also true. Um, if you married the victim, it's made it a legitimate marriage, uh, as horrible as we might find that. It's a tricky thing when we're looking at this. And then one other thing is that in criminal records at the time, they might have charged someone with a crime of raptus. That means, sometimes it means rape and sometimes it means kidnapping. So when we look at the historical records for this, raptus could mean one thing or the other. And it's really hard to know which one it is. And this has actually caused a lot of people to uh, wonder about this because Chaucer was charged with raptus and people are trying to figure out what this means. So when you look at sexual violence in the Middle Ages, the first thing that we should note is that it was not permitted for someone to rape someone. That was not permitted. Please do not build a plot that makes that permissible. Prima nocta, the brave heart thing, it's not true. Complete myth. That said, uh, there was sexual violence at the time, of course, and even though you could prosecute someone for it, again, it's like today, it was easy for people who are powerful to get off uh, without punishment, even though there were cases in which people were successfully convicted of rape. 
Okay, I'm going to leave that behind and again, refer you to um, sex historians for that. So look into that if that's something that you are going to write about. Um, but yeah, I would say please don't use the prima nocta thing. We don't need to have that myth kind of perpetuated. This period was not perfect, but it was not as barbaric as Braveheart will make out. Okay, the next thing that we need to talk about is diversity. And Romance Writers of America is blowing up right now, I know, over issues of diversity. And I just want to give kudos to those people who are making it so that your field is more inclusive to more people. Good on you. Keep up the good work. That's awesome. When it comes to diversity in historical fiction, let me set the record straight for you as a historian. It is not ahistorical to have a diverse Middle Ages. So there you go. Send them to me. I will tell them, these readers who tell you that you are being ahistorical. Medieval Europe was a much more diverse place than people tend to think. There were people who were traveling in the Middle Ages from town to town, from continent to continent, from country to country for all sorts of reasons. For trade, for education, possibly as slaves, for just travel, for pilgrimage. People were traveling all over, all the time. Sometimes they were there as mercenaries in a country that wasn't their own country. Sometimes they were there because that's where the work was. For example, architects or masons or people who were working on a building in a different country. So it was very diverse. You could have a small town that might have, you know, mostly white people in it. But William Chester Jordan's just done a book, which I will link to for you. That show was that Louis the Ninth brought back converts from when he went on crusade and he put them in small towns in France to integrate them into French society. So even in a small town in France, you would have a more diverse population than you might think. So if you have characters who are diverse, that is not ahistorical. The Places where you'd find them the most would be trade ports, of course, because you'd have people doing trade all over the place. On the Mediterranean, especially, Italy had a whole bunch of places that were um, cities that were mostly involved in trade, so you'd have a lot of diversity there. But archaeological evidence will show you that medieval Europe was a diverse place. It's not anachronistic to have people of color in medieval Europe. Again, if you have people who are saying this is anachronistic, send them to me. I'll set the record straight. Also, you could send them to Medieval People of Color, which is a blog on Tumblr. And that person has examples from art from the Middle Ages and different historical periods that show you people of color. Definitely check that out. Now, was there discrimination in the Middle Ages between different peoples? Yes, Absolutely, there was, but it didn't follow the same lines that it does now. So when people are talking about races in the Middle Ages, they're not necessarily talking about people with different skin colors or different features. The um, discrimination that was mostly seen in the Middle Ages was between religions. So you could have people who were of different skin colors, different facial features, who were all Christians, and that would be absolutely fine. But you could have people who were both white and one was a Christian and one was a Jew, and that was a problem. So the discrimination in the Middle Ages mostly went along religious lines. It's not to say that people were nice all the time. Of course, they weren't nice all the time. People now aren't nice all the time, as we have seen too many times. But when it comes to discrimination, our ideas of race are not the same as they were in the Middle Ages. And I'll refer you to the Public Medievalist, which is a website that has a whole bunch of articles on race in the Middle Ages for you to read and to understand better how people uh, saw each other at the time. Again, we're talking about diverse populations in many towns in Europe. Europe at the time, mostly Christian, but you had Jewish people in a lot of towns in the Middle Ages. And they were not just money lenders. That should be made clear as well. They might have their own quarter, depending on which city it was. And in that quarter, you'd have people who are physicians or people who are apothecaries or people who are shoemakers. So when we look at Judaism in the Middle Ages, it's not just people who are moneylenders to the Christians. That's something that I should say from the outset. When there were problems, interfaith problems, it was mostly the Christians who were blaming the Jews for something. 
So especially during the Black Death, they were blaming the Jews for poisoning people. And there was a horrific amount of violence during the Black Death against Jews. And this is not the only time. It was all over Europe where Jews were being persecuted. In fact, the place where you would find faiths interacting with the most harmony most of the time was in Muslim Spain. So you'd find people who were interacting and behaving as neighbors. Now, again, this is not to say that everything was happy between all the people all the time. I would say that the interactions between faiths during the Middle Ages would be full of what we would call microaggressions or even harassment. It would not be easy, for example, for a Jew to walk around some areas of their Christian cities just because people were not always nice. But the large-scale persecutions that we see at some periods were not all the time. So it really depends on who your character is, where you're placing them. So when you're considering your character's faith, their status, their career, you want to consider that... If they were Jewish, they might be facing everyday discrimination and they might be fearful for their lives depending on what time period it was and how hostile their religion was. In many cases and many times during most of the Middle Ages, there was kind of an uneasy peace. When it comes to Islam, we know that the Crusades were a thing. People were trying to make sure that, you know, they had Jerusalem in the hands of the Christians because that was right, the Christians thought at the time. So the Crusades were happening. They were happening in the Middle East. They were also happening in Spain and Portugal, different places around medieval Europe. But that said, the Christians were friendly with the Muslims when they wanted to be, when it served them. So again, using Muslim knowledge to advance their own knowledge in medicine, science, mathematics, that kind of stuff, totally normal in the Middle Ages. Even though we think that it is a black and white thing, it's definitely not. When we look at the diversity in the Middle Ages, it's not all about hatred all the time. It's definitely not a time where you'd want to be a minority, depending on where you were and what the time period was. But it didn't mean that being a minority meant you had a death sentence over you all the time. If you're going to write a character that is not of the Christian faith, just look at what time period where you are, what kind of stuff you see around there. Again, it's an entire continent. It's a thousand years. I can't get to every single one, but I do want to just kind of mention that people had tolerance for each other that we might not necessarily assume if we just watch movies about the Middle Ages. Okay, I've gone on for a long time. This is kind of a long (laughs) podcast and you know, I don't get to everything that I do want to say on this topic, but let's do the lightning round myths that will give you away as somebody who hasn't done their research. (laughs) So when you write your medieval romance novel, don't work within these myths or people will know right away that you didn't do your research. So the first myth is that people thought the earth was flat. I come back to this again and again. It still blows people's minds. Assume that people in the Middle Ages were intelligent. Assume that they could see the horizon and that they could see the way the stars turned and that they understood that the earth was a sphere. They knew it was a sphere. Don't believe it's flat. Another thing you need to know is that they did not wear kilts in Scotland and they didn't have clan tartans in Scotland as we know them in the Middle Ages. This is really disappointing. I know, I know, I know. And I think a lot of people do know this and they put the kilts in there anyway because we do love kilts. They did have blankets that were woven, but they weren't clan tartans as we know them today and they weren't kilts. I'm sorry, it's really disappointing, but it's true. Also, people in the Middle Ages, they never ate turkey or tomato soup or sweet corn or potatoes or chocolate. So get those off the table. And I'm talking to you, medieval themed restaurants. They didn't eat those things because they come from the Americas and they hadn't made contact yet. The Vikings had come over, but they hadn't made uh, trade routes enough for things like turkeys and potatoes and tomatoes to make it over to Europe yet. No chocolate either unfortunately. So don't have your medieval people eating a turkey leg. I will know right away when I read it that you didn't listen to this podcast. Um, They did eat a lot of eels. I think that's important. And there's also somebody on Twitter who I'll link to for you that talks about paying rent in eels. And I just think that's fascinating. 
when it comes to violence in the Middle Ages, there were no chastity belts, there were no iron maidens, there were no pairs of anguish. Most of the torture devices that you see, well, they're fake. So if you want to know more about torture and punishment and that kind of stuff, I would suggest that you look at Larissa Tracy's work and listen to that podcast that I did with Larissa Tracy last spring. Castles, they weren't dull and gray like the ruins that you see today. They were painted and they were covered in tapestries. So when you have something that's set in a castle, it can look beautiful. It can be painted. It can be a place that is very pleasant to be in. And it can even have covered windows with glass or with horn as well. Knights did not just ride their war horses everywhere for fun. And they didn't wear armor at the table. There's a bunch of reasons for this. But again, you know, if it's something that you can't imagine yourself doing, like showing up for dinner in full armor, that's probably not what they did either. That's not a hard and fast rule. Again, you do need to look at exceptions and things. But for the most part, people did not ride their war horses around and they didn't wear their armor to dinner. But they could do somersaults in their armor. They could dance in their armor if they wanted to. The armor was very, very flexible. It was heavy, but it wasn't so heavy that they couldn't move in it. And if you don't believe me, you can look at Medievalist.net's YouTube channel where we have Daniel Jacquet, who has created a medieval set of armor and he's doing somersaults in it. So that's worth looking at anyway. Sometimes people did wear underwear. <laughs> this is something that is supposed to be like a huge myth you know if you put underwear in your romance novel in the middle ages you're definitely wrong except for they have found historical archaeological evidence of underwear so that is in my book you can find the reference to that in my book life in medieval europe not everybody wore underwear all the time and if you look at pictures that are in manuscript illustrations then you see that not everybody wore underwear, but some people did. And again, in my book, you'll see a little story where St. Benedict says, if you need to go out, you can borrow a pair of the communal underwear. Just wash them and put them back when you're done. And speaking of washing, people did bathe at the time. People were a lot cleaner than we imagine. They did bathe and they did use some form of toothpaste usually kind of abrasive stuff. You can find that. I did an article about it for medievalist.net and it's also in the new book if you like. And then finally, um, something that I should mention, we talked about witches with Gemma Holman at the end of 2019, just around Halloween. And witch trials were not a huge thing in the Middle Ages. Most of the most famous witch trials that you see, for example, Salem, that's after the Middle Ages. So being persecuted as a witch was not a thing that happened a lot for a whole bunch of reasons, one of them being, you know, you would be given the chance to be forgiven for something you might have done and uh, only got really punished if you kept doing it. Okay, I've gone on for a really long time. I should probably start to finish off. I did have somebody asking me a question on Twitter about did Christians go to Muslim universities? People did go to each other's universities to study and there was uh, some permissiveness for this as well. You will see things like Sometimes Christians will give Muslims space to pray. Sometimes Muslims will do the same things for Christians. So again, depending on where you're looking at, um, there was a lot of interaction across faiths. Also, this person was asking me, can you have an ex-monk assassin? Can you have a spy that's also a physician? You can have spies, absolutely, because they did have spies at the time. You can even have an ex-monk assassin if you like, or you can have somebody that's still a monk and an assassin because not everybody became a monk right out of being a child. They might become a monk after. You could become a Templar, somebody who was a fighter and also followed a sort of monastic rule. So you can have all sorts of mix and match. And then the last question this person had for me, could you have a spy physician, somebody who's sort of apprentice to a physician and also a spy? I would say you could. I would also say it would probably be a better option to have them be something that didn't require a university education like being a doctor did. You could have somebody who's a spy and also an apothecary. That's been done quite a lot. Candace Robb has apothecaries in her work and you can listen to Candace Robb on my podcast as well. Ellis Peters, I think, has people with medical knowledge as well. More kind of apothecary stuff. I would say if you're going to have a spy have them in a place where they could have access to nobles and politics, but also trade. So an apothecary is a great option because they would be getting imported spices to make their pharmaceuticals. 
Also, even something that's a little bit more humble, like a tailor. A tailor would have to show up and take care of the clothes for people who are very important, but also they would be talking to people who are training because they need to get the fabric. So you could have a spy physician, of course, you can have a spy anything you like, but a physician wouldn't give you as much range for talking to people outside of maybe an inner circle. So that's my suggestion. So for all the people who are who have these amazing ideas that I saw on Twitter, they want to write these novels, I'm going to tell you, go for it. And I hope you enjoy it. And I hope that you have a great time inventing stuff about the Middle Ages. And I hope that you create stuff that reflects who we want to be today, the romance stories that we want to see today, so that we're not kind of relying on 30-year-old stuff to tell us what we should do fantasize about. So I'm so happy that people are still interested in reading and writing romance novels. I hope you find this stuff a little bit helpful. If you want to sign up for my mailing list on my website, you get a free little PDF called Six Steps to Better Historical Fiction. You might find that helpful. Um, You can also look at my books, which I'll mention at the very end of the podcast. Before we go, here's Peter from Medievalist.net to tell us what's on the website. What's new, Peter? Hi, Danielle. Yes, we have a lot about warfare this week. Uh, just just came out like that. So you can read about Byzantine espionage, tales from the Hundred Years' War, our list of the most important weapons of the Middle Ages. So that's in there. Um, if you want something a little different, uh, we also have interesting news about a Viking rune stone from the ninth century and how it may have warned of a climate catastrophe. So all that and more on Medievalist.net. That sounds super exciting. Thanks, man. Thanks. If you love getting the type of information in today's episode, why not become one of our patrons? Patrons of the Medieval Podcast can get all sorts of great stuff like subscriptions to Medieval Warfare magazine, books from our book club with Boyd Allen Brewer, and an ad-free version of Medievalist.net. You can find it all at patreon.com slash medievalists. To start your research and your journey back to the Middle Ages, you can follow Medievalist.net on Facebook or Twitter at Medievalists. You can find me, Danielle Sabalski, on social media at 5min Medievalist or 5 Minute Medievalist. And you can find me on Amazon where my latest book, Life in Medieval Europe, Fact and Fiction, is on sale worldwide. Our music is Beyond the Warriors by Guy Frog. Thanks for listening and for doing your part to keep the Middle Ages alive.